one typical British town. Its high street was once its heart and soul. Not anymore. But what if we could turn back time? To the days of the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. A group of shopkeepers and their families have left the 21st century behind. You are going to discover what the high street was really like. Your aim is to make this town fall in love with its high street again. Today's mantra is sell, sell, sell. Each week they're living and trading through a different era. Can't get any more left. From Victorian to Edwardian. Rabbits, pheasants. Through peacetime <laughs> and wartime. The swinging 60s to the shocking 70s. <laughs> 100 years of high street history. It's absolutely magical. Can they sell the products of the past to 21st century customers? Oh, the poor creatures. I'd be frightened to give this to the birds. <laughs> pin, pin. And can they make a profit while they're at it? This is unbelievably hard. I don't know how these poor buggers did this in the old days. If I'm really being honest, I hate it. Tonight, the high street moves into World War II. The shopkeepers and their customers are in for a shock. Well, I'm used to selling, and I'm not selling now. I'm rational. It's hard. My problem is that I've used up all my rations. We live in uh, constrained times. And things get fraught. Scousers and Geordies don't get on. But all I wanted was bloody baps. How hard is it they've made the bread? But can they persuade the town to love their high street in wartime? I feel like I could take this all home and in one go have a good meal. And starve for the rest of the week. The shopkeepers are travelling forward in time to prove themselves on the World War II high street. And for the first time, profit isn't everything. Shopkeepers had to take on a new role. They became part of the official war effort, regulating rationing, distributing limited goods, and making sure everyone got a fair share to survive. The struggle will be the, the lack of takings. There's not going to be a lot of takings. But we've decided that um, it's the Second World War and it's uh, the Dunkirk spirit. There's nothing better than the adversity to bring people together. It's not really going to be about making lots of money. It's about getting through. As they arrive in the market square, they are confronted with the austerity of wartime. It's sort of very murky looking, isn't it? Very yeah. drab and What's the war? No one will come in if they see it all horrible like this. We're a British restaurant. Oh. A British restaurant? That's what it says. <laughs> a restaurant, man. That's not just cakes. Saffron's right to be worried. For three eras, the Devlins have struggled in all their catering endeavours. I didn't think I could make cakes, but I really didn't think I could make them this badly. What on earth have we got us into? <laughs> Enforcing the strict rules of the era is the High Street's own Chamber of Commerce. Fifth generation baker Tom Herbert, social historian Juliet Gardner, and successful greengrocer Greg Wallace. The holiday feel of the 1930s is over. Your challenge is to give the people of Shepton Mallet the full World War II experience and get you and them pulling together as a community. We're not expecting you to make huge profits. In fact, we're not even sure you're going to have very much to sell. You are in the front line of the British war effort, introducing Jephthah Mallet to a culture of make, do and mend. I think we're going to find out which of you will look after each other and which of you will look after yourselves. Good luck, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest change on the high street is that the Baker's has also become a British restaurant. Think positive. Oh, think positive, yes, think yes, positive. Got, oh, this fantastic... Oh, wow! wow. Oh, it's so wicked! The government set up British restaurants and they really were to help with rationing and to feed people, mainly workers, um, give them a decent midday meal. They found it difficult with a tea shop. I think running a restaurant's going to be a heck of a challenge. After some disasters with food in previous eras, the Devlins are surprisingly upbeat. What we have here is a very utilitarian establishment for simple food, um, along with a bakery, we'll be able to do. Our butchers this week are selling nothing but mum. 
The ration list is as follows. Mutton, one and a half pound of meat to be sold. Who eats mutton these days? I'm not, I'll bet even if you ask people, they wouldn't even know what mutton was. Mutton is the meat of a sheep over two years old. So that's a huge challenge for our butcher. Even clothes were rationed. Dressmaker Jill will have to persuade her customers to make do and mend instead of selling them new dresses. It looks a bit empty, yeah? A lot of it won't be selling stuff so much as fixing what little they do have. Blacksmith Simon's 1930s toy shop has been replaced with a practical hardware store. Uh, it's quite sparsely stocked. It looks as if it's just really essential items. If there's one family I think are going to find it a real shock, and that's the grocers, because they've been king of this street up to now. For three eras, the Surgisons have thrived and made huge profits. Today's mantra is sell, sell, sell. But the war has changed everything. <sighs> oh, Mother Hubbard, look at it. For master salesman Carl, shortages are a shock. You see what we've got on the shelves now, and I bet you that's all we've got. Daughter Safi is equally aggrieved. I've only got two oranges, which is nothing. I could eat them within an hour, two oranges. I usually I love oranges. People are going to be quite disappointed. When we're talking about shortages, before the war, Britain was importing something like 55 million tonnes of food. Within a month of the start of the war, that had dropped by two thirds. So basically, the sweet fanny Adams in the fridge. <laughs> Britain was really an island under siege. As well as distributing meagre rations, the shopkeepers will have to survive on them. Two ounces of butter, cheese, margarine, lard and tea, four ounces of bacon, and just one egg per person per week. And that'll be our daily ration, will it? Or weekly no, ration? Weekly ration. <laughs> it's not, is it? We get that much oh, cheese. We could eat that in five seconds. There's not a lot there. Well, not for a week. There's probably enough for a day. Well, eat frugally. But I'll still moan when I'm hungry, because I don't like getting hungry. I get pretty upset when I'm hungry. I think it's going to be challenging, because there are lots of us, and mm. you guys have got hollow legs. There's probably going to be a few growly tummies around. You have your own food, so you, like, decide what you do with it? No, 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 you don't have your own food. <laughs> it's not for you to say, oh, well, that's my rasher of bacon, isn't it? It's about Mum and I being able to use all of the rations for the family. It's not all doom and gloom for Rafe and the rest of the shopkeepers, as they have been given a communal vegetable garden and chickens to help supplement their rations. The group of local customers who have shopped with them for the past three eras won't be as lucky. They can only buy rationed goods at the shops for the next week. Um, a bit anxious about the size of it. <laughs> Looking through it doesn't seem to be as much in as I thought there might be. There's a war on, don't you know, so let's get inside. This era will be the ultimate test of customer loyalty. So how many children in the family must have got? It's uh, four boys and me. I feel sorry for the people in the olden days. During the war, grocers and butchers became bureaucrats for the government and were expected to get to grips with a complex rationing system quickly. We don't keep the books, they keep them. Yes, I'm all right, not on the envelope. Stop getting excited. Oh, okay. I'm hate paper well, in a passion. At the butchers, Sharp and Son have got to break the news of just how small the meat ration is. What can we get and how much of it? No, we don't. Well, you can get one and a half pounds of okay. meat. Starvation diet, then. <laughs> oh, yeah, just get to see how we do. And at the grocers, it's a similar story. Is that two ounces each, then, for a week? For a week. So do be sparing, my darling. <laughs> That's very shocking. It was a real eye-opener, because the shelves are just bare. It's like walking into a closed shop, almost. It looks so good. I would love to have some more, but obviously I can't. I'm just worried it's not going to last very long, like, yes. two of us. It's not just the customers who are disappointed with the realities of rationing. This bit, it's a bit strange, there's nothing here. People would have come in and really seen this and would have gone, bugger, what am I going to do tonight? So it's quite disheartening, really. Even if we sold everything in the shop, we don't get about £100, because there's so little prices. And if, in like all the other years, we've gotten thousands of pounds. Well, I'm used to selling, and I'm not selling now, I'm rationing. And it's not the same, it's horrible. One of the things that wasn't rationed during the war was bread. At the baker's, Caroline is back in charge. 
but she is restricted to making the national loaf. The wartime Ministry of Food ordered bakers to make a wholemeal loaf with added vitamin supplements to maximize Britain's nutrition. But some elements of the recipe jar with modern tastes. I felt really uncomfortable about putting seven and a half tablespoonfuls of salt. And I live in fear of yet another salty loaf and a, a whole pile of complaints from people who are already going to be on the back foot because they're challenged by the shortages and the rationing anyway. Very salty. Caroline's fears about the dough are borne out. Salty. Oh, it tastes like the sea! Yeah. I'll leave you to it. The salt was added to help preserve the loaf, but that's no comfort for Caroline. I would just like to be able to make what I consider to be a good loaf of bread. And, and here we are in the fourth era, and we're still making what I perceive to be, well, just, just inferior bread. And, and as a baker, that's just, it was just so frustrating. Caroline is right to be concerned, as during the war, this wholemeal loaf was universally hated. In fact, people dubbed it Hitler's secret weapon. But what will their customers make of it? Hi, I'd like some white bread, please. It's not white, it's brown. Oh, no. Really? Yes. OK, I'll just have to make do with brown then, I but suppose. The salt level, what we should tell you now, is relatively high. Would you like to try a sandwich? I would, yes. But it's not that bad. Yeah. It's not that bad. Our first sale of the day. <laughs> Oh, Lord! <laughs> the National Loaf isn't exactly a big hit with customers, but they're getting into the spirit of making do. Chewy, it's chewy and a bit salty, but fine. Yes. You have to yes, the isn't it? On the streets of Shepton Mallet, Blacksmith Simon and dressmaker Jill have teamed up to introduce their customers to a culture of make do and mend. I think it's hugely important, still continue to strive to be self sufficient. There could be a crisis just around the corner at any time. They're collecting scrap and clothes that can be mended and recycled. This is something you want an edge put on. Yeah, I can mm. do that. You Thank you. The blacksmiths were the first recyclers. Make do and mend is just second nature to us. In wartime, the government encouraged everyone to recycle their scrap metal for the war effort. In Shepton Mallet, they collected 18 tonnes to build a tank. Oh, wow. But the bodice gorgeous. is really pretty. Yeah. In the 40s, things weren't available. You know, you couldn't get fabric. You couldn't buy clothes off the peg. So the people with the skills to make things would have been um, indispensable, which is a great feeling. Yeah. Do you feel good that you've actually managed to, to be able to recycle some of this? Yeah. Is it better than just throwing it away? To make their rations go as far as possible, the shopkeepers have pooled their resources. Grocer's wife Debbie is taking on responsibility for putting together a communal meal every night. And to embrace what's coming ahead, and uh, I think we're kind of going to get there. <laughs> I reckon this area now is going to become quite a meeting place because everybody's just seemed to gravitate here today, this, and everyone's coming and saying, Oh, this is really cool, and then they're sitting down and they're just staying longer. So, we're all girls. We're cool. We're doing well. Yeah, we're doing well. Andrew and Michael have opened early as they want to catch the Shepton Mallet breakfast tray. It's not bacon they're cooking, but macon, made from sheep, not pigs. Macon is cured mutton, 
We're turning a cheek, and we're pig. We make bacon out of mutton. That's where we've got bacon. Bacon, burgers, mossages. But it might be a tough sell. Mutton, they say, as tough as mutton. That was the... Tough as old boots. I'm confident that we can get people to try our bacon. As to whether they will buy it will be another issue. Go on, get your bacon. We're in a war, hard times. Go on. We can make sheep taste like pig. Just as nice. Best thing you can have for your breakfast. Go on. Mutton, bacon, bacon. Is it mutton? Is it mutton? Is it, it certainly is mutton. So why aren't there many pigs? So there isn't enough of anything, so you've got to make the most of it. Everyone wants bacon, right. so what we're doing is making bacon out of anything we can get our hands on. There you go. Interesting, seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that is gorgeous. Oh, it's very tasty. That's all right, actually. That really is all right. Bacon, it's an easy sell to be honest, because it tastes like bacon. Everyone recognises the flavours in there. You've got a slight mutton hue in the background, but it's not negative. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, is it not? The butchers have managed to satisfy their customers. And at the grocers, Carl and Debbie have a scheme to do the same. We were a bit sneaky in the last era, and we've actually hid some food. <laughs> we knew there was war coming, so we've... Um, decided to uh, keep some stuff back that we knew that uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be under rationing rules so we could, uh, one, keep our customers happy and two, obviously, uh, keep the family's finances in good shape for the war. This one thing, let's open the door then. There's our kits in here. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. Yeah, little things to sell. <laughs> Harry, if, if, the, um, if the Ministry of Food find out, you're going to prison, not me, all right? <laughs> See what we've got. Wow. And we've got sugar, Ooh. spaghetti. I think that's an amazing stash, Harry. We're going to get it under the counter, keep it under the counter, and then when customers are coming in saying, have we got this, have we got that, say, no, but we have got this, and unfortunately, it, you know, it's a bit expensive. We've got brown sugar. Brown sugar, that's like gold dust. I reckon we could sell it for almost 10 quid a bag, couldn't we? I mean, over the likes of Mr Blake, and Mrs. Payne, they've got little kiddies. They'll want ketchup and we've got ketchup. I think it's Mrs. got to be a good five or a jar, though. Well, there we were 250 in that last year. We don't want to rob them blind. Well, no, because they've got an account that you, yes, you want know. them to spend their money here. Don't well, we? they will spend their money here, don't worry. That's the whole idea of the okay. plan. It's a cunning okay. plan, as they say. Want to get that covered up or something? Mm -hmm. Whilst the grocers are helping themselves, the bakers have a hard task ahead. They need to open the British restaurant and feed the town. You'll be serving a group of 30 school children at 1 p.m. <laughs> okay. 30? Where are we going to put 30 kids? The other like, problem with the stuff today is that um, mostly everything's to do with carrot. For example, yeah. carrot fudge. Mm. Boiled carrots served with some orange essence, and that's it. During the war, it was believed that carrots helped the RAF see in the dark. But this was a cunning ruse by the government to conceal from Germany the invention of radar and also get rid of a glut of carrots. We've got this recipe now for um, carolade, which is just swede and carrot, and then put in a muslin and just squeezed out. Oh, yeah. No, 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 it's not. Not. no. Not. We tell them afterwards. Yes, yeah, sweet and carrot. <laughs> For the main course, two slightly more familiar wartime classics. Spam fritters and corned beef hash. I feel just like a school dinner lady. I've never... <laughs> just... I thought it was bad enough cooking for six of us all the time, but 30 people. Definitely school dinners. <laughs> God! <laughs> At the grocer's, Customers are still getting used to the realities of rationing. You wouldn't want to wait in queues no. all the time. I wouldn't have the time to wait in queues like this all the time. Eggs. Um, your weekly allowance each. You're allowed one egg each. Is that right? Yes. One egg. Uh, dear, what are we going to do? <laughs> Cereals. Yeah. Cereals. We have got these wheat flakes, but for our special customers, we've got some on the back. Yes, do come this way. Excuse me. I can tempt you with a few of my goodies. The 
But these can't be on account, they've got to be. So we've got shredded wheat, we've got cornflakes, cream crackers, lion's tea. Can we have some shredded wheat? So you sort of certainly oh, can, yeah. I'll just uh, put those on there. I'll tell you one thing, now you, you can be the first and only customers in Shepton Mallet to get cane sugar during the war. In that case, it's mine. It's got to be a fiver. Fiver? It's got to be, isn't it? So we've got these, right? Now, as you know, before yeah. the war, these were around about uh, two quid a pack. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's wartime now, and I'm afraid they've doubled their four pound a pack. Goodness me. All right, that's okay. right. <sighs> right. Have you got a bag, Mrs. Marsh? Special one there, don't know if we've seen that one. Yeah, we've seen it. All right, see. Yeah. We've yeah. been doing the back. Have you? Yeah. What's around the back? Oh, you've got some special yeah. items around yeah. there, mate. I think Carl looked after us rather well. He said we were special customers, which was really nice. That was mm. quite exciting to be offered something perhaps other people wouldn't. You know, I like that. I've managed to sell some already. I've made, make, make what? Christ, over a tenner already. So it's a good start of the week. So would you be interested in coming and having a look at my little goodies? I've got um, some really good things here. But, um, How much are the cream crackers? They're three quid a box. Yeah, so that's cool. How much is the oh, lemon whispering? Two quid for a tin of sink. Oh, I'm the local spib, as they say, so yeah. <laughs> I'll get it for an emergency. As shocking as they might be, Carl's prices are actually quite reasonable. In wartime, luxuries such as melons could change hands for as much as two pounds. A whopping sixty-eight pounds in today's money. One bag hiding jobs. <laughs> yeah, I mean the black market. I've got no knowledge of it in real life, but I mean that's what I would do if it was me. You know, the chance to make a couple of bob. I know by the end of the week that tray would be empty. Back at the British restaurant, the school kids are arriving. Can the bakers succeed in winning them over to wartime fare? First up is the caroleade. the corned beef will go down better. It's like cow pie. <laughs> I'm not saying it's disgusting, it's just it's not, I'm not used to it. <laughs> but vile. The meal hasn't been a success, and there are a lot of leftovers. I wasn't expecting the reaction to be good, you know. But they said that the spam was horrible, the corned beef was horrible. Well, to be honest, that would ask what everyone would eat. So, if they don't like it, then tough. They wouldn't survive back then. My feet have never hurt so much, ever. I, it's just... Like whinging, I know, it's such a whinge, but they hurt. There's no let-up for Caroline and Nigel. They have to now prepare the next day's national loaf. Debbie has also asked them to make bread rolls and she's got a special dinner of mutton burgers and rhubarb crumble planned for tonight's communal meal. But Nigel has a problem with it. Debbie wants to make burgers in a bun, but what we have to do, bearing in mind the period, is use what we've got. And we've got bread left over from uh, the lunch today, so we'll just have to use that. Whilst the bakers are working hard, the Surgisons have discovered the communal veg patch. During the war, everyone was encouraged to dig for victory by growing their own food. Land everywhere was taken over for growing, even the gardens at Buckingham Palace. This vegetable garden is meant for all the shopkeepers, but the Surgisons have a different plan. Yeah, I think this is really good because it's like, almost like free stock. Just fill up that basket it's as much as you can get in it. Okay, so, okay. And then we'll pull out more tomorrow if we need more if we sell them all. It's like a massive profit, isn't it, Mum? We could probably charge £2.95. Yeah, we'll sure to uh, feed everyone and make some money. I think selling it's only the right thing. You wouldn't give it away. Dig for victory is what they say, and that's what we're doing. <laughs> it's been a triumphant afternoon in the garden. But Debbie has just found out that Nigel hasn't made her bread rolls. Oh, I'll just set a place now because again I've got that tick head of a man. I just can't who, do it anymore. Who, 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 who do you think? Nigel. Yeah. But all I wanted was bloody baps. How hard is it? They've made the bread. That's the hard bit. Rolling the baps is easy. Scouses and Geordies don't get on, but at the end of the day, um, 
regardless of whether we're going or not, we, we, we live, we're going to live the period. Um, and it's just, a, it's, it's just a difference of opinions, I thought. You know, she's right now. No, she's wrong and I'm right. <laughs> All he needed to contribute for dinner tonight was to make baps. I've made the crumble, I'm, I was making the burger mix, the baked potatoes in the oven, you know. How, I just I don't know how I can be nice all the time when he's been an absolute toss pot, and it's really made me cross. Um, bit of a mountain over Mole Hill, but um, we'll get through it. But I don't feel comfortable now. That's the difficult part. I don't want any dinner. <laughs> I can, but I smell burning. Having said that, oh God. <laughs> oh hell. Oh, her crumble is burnt. Oh God. It's not funny, okay? It's not funny. There's nothing I can do about them, you know? I could smell the burn and say, when I came in, it's not rocket science, you've got stuff in the oven that they're going to burn. I'm not, I'm not really happy just to keep uh, providing everybody if I'm not going to get something back in return. It's the final straw for Debbie, and Caroline is now in the firing line. Caroline, hear me out. If you would give us that bread anyway, then why couldn't you just turn them into baps? Does it matter what form that bread takes? Have you tried to eat a burger in sliced bread? To say, actually, what we're contributing is not to your specific requirements. It's crazy. It's just what I expected, that was all. But if we can't deliver that, then really... Well, you could have delivered, you just chose not to. I think to say that we chose not to makes it out to be a deliberate thing, and that's unfair. With the wartime spirit now in tatters, tonight's communal meal is cancelled. It doesn't matter who was right and who was wrong. It wasn't about that. It was just about the fact that someone was upset. And, and I didn't want them to be upset anymore. An air raid. Pull that light out. So, what are we supposed to do now? Get in that little shelter? Okay, people, I think we should kind of go. Anybody here? Bring it out and stay down to the, the bushes on the side door, please. Nigel is acting as air raid warden, responsible for the safe evacuation of the high street. Caroline, come on, come on! There's a siren, come on, go! This is only a drill. If this was the real thing, they would only have 12 minutes to get to a shelter before the bombs started to fall. Into the side door of shops. Most of the shopkeepers head for the cellar, but the butchers and the blacksmith have to get into their Morrison shelter, a small steel cage under the kitchen table. Mind you, mind your head on the corner. Oh, this is a bit cosy, isn't it? Bakers and grocers will have to spend the evening together after all. My, my heart was just pounding. The siren makes you, <laughs> makes you move. We could be under here for days. W would you get in trouble for not going to your shelter? No, you just die, don't you? There's no trouble in that. If the house was bombed and you weren't under here, then imagine you'd be the one was, that died. Imagine if this was covered in rubble. Yeah, how the hell would you get out? You could bloody you die. Wouldn't, would you? It wasn't just the big cities of Britain that were bombed. In Shepton Mallet, the skies were alive with enemy bombers, and more than 200 bombs were dropped, attempting to destroy the nearby railway line. People used to have to live on their wits, yeah. do you know? And that made them, well, I don't know what it made them. It must have made them very different people to how they started. Much harder than us lot. Oh, yes. Oh, much tougher. It, it does kind of bring it home. This really did happen, and uh, just coming actually out of this and seeing if your house and everything you had was still here, that must have been the worst thing of all. Or maybe if you'd lost somebody, or somebody had been left behind and you were told that you couldn't come back. Either you were left behind or I was left behind. It would be so really upsetting. Actually, I came out thinking that Chloe was ahead of me, and ridiculously, I don't know how it happened, but Chloe was behind me. I was absolutely panic-stricken then. Oh, I nearly forgot you. Oh, I mean, oh, sorry.
things are back to normal after last night's air raid. And even Caroline and Debbie have gained some perspective on their argument. What happened yesterday, as much as you'd like to, it not to happen, it did happen. And you just have to deal with it and get on. I've been over to see Caroline and uh, we've had a good chat and business as usual, really. Everybody gets stressed and strung out. And actually, you know, I could have been perhaps a bit more sympathetic. And you just have to put it to one side, you know, because there's a war on. As the dust settles, everyone is back to work. Simon has reopened his forge to mend customers salvage and is making good on his claim that blacksmiths were the first recyclers. The amount of tools that I've got to, to sharpen, to refurbish, to resurrect from the dead uh, is unbelievable. The tine's broken off. I've got a cut nail here, which is actually carbon steel. And if I can try and fire weld that on there, I can re repair this and get it back to work in order. Oh, that's nice. It's just the yeah, material. Like I think that's yeah. nice. At the dressmakers, the people of Shepton Mallet are discovering the joys of make do and mend. Okay, it's done. What a little nightdress. <laughs> Made out of a balance sheet. With the help of Jill, customers are seeing new possibilities in their old clothes. Although it's too big for me now, what I thought was, if I had it cut off where the pockets go to, right. do you see what I mean? So slightly shorter, and then, can you see at the back, if it could be more of a fitted shape? At the grocers, it's business as usual. It's my little black book, madame. <laughs> it's a black market. But the Chamber of Commerce are back. They've been talking to some of the Surgisons' customers, and Juliet is appalled. I'm not pleased about what I've heard about Carl and Debbie and the family. The problem is, Carl's an entrepreneur, and what was what was applauded in peacetime, you know, making a making a decent living, you know, pulling a few tricks here and there. In wartime, it's frowned on. It undermines society. It undermines the war effort, and what's more, it's criminal activity. Hello, Juliet. Hello, Carl, Debbie. Right, Carl and Debbie, I've been talking to some of your customers. And quite honestly, you haven't been playing the game. I am shocked. The reason rationing was introduced was about fair shares for everybody. They didn't want it so that just those could, who could afford it could have more. Everybody had to feel that the sacrifice was being equally borne. And to be honest, I'm horrified to say I think you're abusing it. What have you got to say? Um, well, yes, we have been running a little bit of a black market. I must admit, we have. Um, I've always been favoured more others more than others. I mean, if people have got the money, then uh, we've let them have the uh, the black market products. That's looking after number one. That's not looking after the community. I understand that, yeah. I suppose, in, in retrospect, I suppose you're right, yeah. And I, it, but you say it's a salesman in me, I can't help it. It's serious, this, and I'm going to have to make you realise how serious it was. Now, this is a criminal activity, and I have to tell you, the government came down very heavily. What I am going to recommend is a fine. That fine is going to be £100. That translates into today's money nearly £4,500. Now, I hope that will bring it home to you just what you're doing in wartime. OK. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. So we have nothing to... Uh, it doesn't matter, though, doesn't matter. It's not about making money, is it? It does, sort of. Anyway. Things, we haven't taken any money this week, no. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll be in debt for the next few years. I really don't, don't care, honestly. I was looking after my family, and I'm really strong about that. My family is very important, and they come first. And then if there's anything left for the rest of the country, then I'm sure there would be. I'm only a small family, then it's fine. So I've got no conscience of that whatsoever, honestly. <laughs> While Carl is unrepentant, it's left to the bakers to try and instill the wartime spirit in Shepton Mallet. That's the They've got to cook for an hour and a half. If, you, if they're too small, they'll just disintegrate. It's round two of the British restaurant. They've got 15 people coming for lunch and two hours to prepare two wartime classics, rabbit stew and braised sheep's tongue. They smell terrible. 
terrible, actually. And, and, and also, I've looked at what the instructions are, and it says by the time that when they're cooked, you have to start taking out all the bones and, and skin them. There's not going to be anything left. Look at that. I think I've never even done any sort of thing like this before, and I know somehow what I'm doing. For dessert, it's eggless date and raisin pudding. It's very stodgy. It just, I think it was an era of stodge. And I think we've, we've pulled it together. And that's down to the children as well, because they've, they straight away know what, what's expected of them. They got the veg going, and we're there. Jack's made the dumplings. So it's absolutely brilliant. To be honest with you, and we don't want the children knowing this, because actually, you know, they'll only demand more from us. But actually, we're really, really pleased with yeah. the way the kids muck in. Hopefully what you've seen today is, is a family working together. Bakers think they've cracked it, but it's the diners who will decide whether the meal's a success. Right. These local pensioners actually lived through World War II, and they'll know the genuine article. Go and put that milk out on that table. Actually, no, yes, on that table, and then... No, actually, wait, wait. What about him in here? Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, he's dead. Table one. That's table one? Yes. For the, ra um, the rabbit stew, but we don't have any better. No, oh, all right, yeah, thank you. <laughs> We've got bread, but no better, no because bread. there's a war on. Two rabbit stews. Yeah. See this well-oiled machine here? The rabbit stew. And it's, we used to get rabbit during the war, and it was a treat if you managed to get a rabbit. I wouldn't like to tell you what we had in the war. Half of it went in the swill bin. It was very nice, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of nice cabbage as well, yeah. I appreciated having that because I haven't had tongue cooked like that probably since then, actually. You all right? Thank you. We've had an absolutely lovely meal. It put me back to my childhood. Thanks so much. When I was about 10 or 11, and it tasted exactly the same. It was gorgeous. <laughs> so you thought it was very authentic? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. The whole, the whole thing has been authentic. You, you, I feel, anyway, having lived through it, that I'm, I'm reliving it again now. It was lovely because I met up with a school friend that I hadn't seen for over 70 years. Really nice. <laughs> what if is now growing in here is the sense of community in Shepton. People are sitting, it, there it is. People are spending more longer in here than they need to. There's no urgency to go, even if they're just buying a loaf of bread, they're staying in and other people are coming in and chatting. And I, I just think it's lovely. Caroline is seeing the upside of the war, but after days of rationing, Shepton Mallet is finding it tough. Tired. Hungry, <laughs> totally stressed out. <laughs> Been waiting uh, for one hour, 45 minutes, and just on a queue. It's pretty painful. I actually find it rather anxiety provoking. Queuing up, waiting to get into a shop where you're hoping there's going to be some food. Do you have any rice? No, I would really like rice, actually. Me too. Is there anything else you have around the back that I might be able to Just what you see on the shelves is oh, everything you've got. Flour. So, uh, if there's anything I can buy without a ration book. There is rabbit. Anything else? Rabbit. Rabbit, is that it? <laughs> my problem is that I've used up all my rations. Well, I'm trying to feed four, but it's a bit hard. Customers queuing up and we've got an out to sell them. There's, there's nothing to sell. So you can't, can't give me anything today? I'm sorry, but we live in uh, constrained times. I feel like I could take this all home and in one go we'll have a good meal and starve for the rest of the week. I was hoping you could actually just extend my ration. I honestly couldn't get anything anywhere else. I'm going to starve. With the customers feeling the pinch, the high street is about to experience even more upheaval. I come bearing news. Clearly, Andrew, it's uh, very likely that a man with your skills would be uh, called to offer your services to the catering corps we would like you to leave the high street. In World War II, men from 18 to 41 were conscripted into the services, which means grocer's son, Harry, is being sent off too. <laughs> Carl is joining him to give Debbie an authentic taste of what it was like to lose the men for a second time in a generation. 
she'll step up to the mantle, she always does, she's brilliant at it, but it, she does miss me, she does love me, and, I, and vice versa, I miss her and love her. So it's going to be quite sad, really. I always cope on my own, that's what I do, but it's not the point. I don't want to cope on my own. I want Carl to be here and Harry. This adventure's not really turning out as an adventure in this era. Yeah, yeah. Bakers were initially a protected trade, so Nigel is staying put. While Debbie may miss Carl, for butcher's boy Michael, it's an opportunity to run the Sharp Empire. Dad's gone to war. Um, I'm not too bothered about that because I get to run the Sharp, which would be really great. But the Chamber of Commerce has a surprise for Michael. Her name is Anne Davidson, a lady butcher from Scotland. He might be a bit upset because he's never worked with a lady before. And he's always worked with his dad, so he'll be a bit upset because he's not in charge. Hello. Hello. Hi, man. You Hi. must be Michael. I am. Yes, I'm the new manager of the shop. I knew your dad's away to war. You're going to be manager? Yes. All right. So that kind of means you're a boss, doesn't it? Yes. I can have that. It's my shop. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to run it. Oh, well. I'm sorry, Michael. You'll just have to put up with me. You're only 14, Michael. You can't do a shop on your own. OK, Michael. I'll go and get my coat on, and then we'll get some customers in and start selling. All right, okay. all right. Oh, I'm not going to be able to take orders from the Scotch. With the men at war, women took over men's jobs, not just in factories and munitions plants, but in shops too. It would save the ministry lots of money just to send her somewhere else. Even now, a lady butcher can cause quite a stir. I don't mean to be rude, but yes, I'm, I'm not used to seeing a lady in yes, the butchers. Have you qualified? Have you trained as a butcher? Yes, I've qualified. It's come as a surprise to me to see a female butcher. Not that I'm sexist or anything, you know. <laughs> they look at you and you think, I can't butcher. you. I look at you. You've got to prove yourself. Right, Michael, you put this away from me, please. You've got the note of the price, Michael. You need to get tidied up now for more customers coming in. He doesn't like me he's staring around, he doesn't like me. Because he thought he was in charge, I see. Got a bit of paper, Michael, please. Don't like being told what to do at all. No, 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 no. That's just not going to happen very smoothly. It's not just Michael who is feeling down. Everyone on the high street is finding wartime grueling. I never realised they worked just so hard for nothing. It's been a really tiring day. I, I was up at six this morning. We're still on the rations. Uh, breakfasts aren't very decent. L lunches are not very decent. We've run out of milk, so we're down to black tea. Usually, if I want something, I can have it. And now, if I want something, I have to, I can't. So it's a bit, you know. Uh... It's vital that they keep their spirits up. So the Chamber of Commerce have organised a dance to boost morale. And Jill, the dressmaker, wants to look her best. <laughs> it's so I look like I'm wearing stockings. Look, it, look, it works, doesn't it? Yeah. Compared yeah, to how white it. my legs were before, it does work. In wartime, beauty had to be improvised. They do it wonky. Make do creativity was key. That feels straight. To be honest, the seams aren't too bad. A used match could become an eyebrow pencil. Beetroot lipstick. Britain had nearly six years of stress and monotony in wartime. That's why dances became so popular as an escape. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you like the stunts? I'd love to! Great. Oh, do you know what? How we to do the chicken head? That was the thing. <laughs> With a stranger, no less. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> to actually let your hair down like this and, and laugh. Because actually, yeah, there have been times we've cried rather than laughed, and uh, we've actually just been, yeah. you know, yeah, just so, so happy. Oh, chin chin, oh, my God. <laughs> and relaxed tonight. It's been fab, really fab. Yeah, it's been really amazing. If we had more nights like this, you would have happy people working <laughs> in the shops every day, wouldn't we? Don't push it now, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real shame that something terrible like a war has to happen to bring people together and to bring out, you know, the, the community spirit. It's a shame that um, we can't remember those bad times and keep that good community spirit when things are better. Go on then, Chloe, open the box. The next morning, and it's an early start. Except for Michael, the butcher's boy, who seems to have forgotten his duties. Are your shop open today, Michael? I don't know. Good morning. A bit late this morning. Aye. No alarm clock, you see. Oh, wow. Well, you need to get that sorted then, won't you? Um, this won't do coming at this time in the morning to run a business. It doesn't matter really on this day because Shepton Mallet is dead as a doornail. Hmm. That's something? not brace, Michael. That's flank. Oh, well, it looked like breast. <laughs> no, that's flank, Michael. Just shows you how much I don't know. Well, it'll make us do anyway. Well, you're only 14, so you'll not know everything about me, do you? He's too cocky. Actually, he knows everything. He didn't even know that was a flank. At the dressmakers, customers are picking up their refashioned clothes. Your coat has been remodelled and shortened. Do you want to try it on? Let's try it on. I hope you like it. I also noticed the lining was a bit ripped, so I oh, was prepared it? that for you oh, as well. Just under the arms. Shown showing them that make, do and mend can be achieved and can be really fun and you can end up with some really kind of cool stuff from nothing. Oh, oh, I'm really pleased with that. You see, I'll get so much more... Oh, doesn't it look nice it in looks the back? Lovely on you. Downstairs, Simon is doing his bit. Right, this is very sharp now. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very so much. So I've actually put a real oh, sharp you, edge on it. You have. Being part of this experiment is really a fantastic opportunity for me to demonstrate my skills and how people like me, colleagues in the business, this sort of business, can be useful to people in the present day. Oh my god! So you've got a workable Fork again. Brilliant. So I can dig my potatoes up with ease now. The war is drawing to an end on the high street, which means the men will soon return and reclaim their jobs. For Michael, that's a relief. I'm ordered to go back home now, Michael. Thank you very much. Right, thanks a lot. See ya. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Michael. See ya. Bye. I'm not going to miss her. At the grocer's, Debbie's doing her final accounts. 22, 22, 51, 60, 65, 72, 75. I've done all the totten, totten up of everything. And you know what? For the fact that we only took £31 worth of under-counter goods, I really think, was it worth it in the long run? You know, we've got a massive fine and I am gutted, really. VE Day saw the biggest street party Britain had ever witnessed. Today, just as they did in 1945, the people of Shepton Mallet are bringing dishes made from their rations to share with the shopkeepers. Oh, I say, what have we got here? Lovely. Oh, look at these! I used up all my rations of jam. Oh, oh, cheers. Cheers. Oh, cheers! Cheers, darling. Get some cheers. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, good morning. Happy. How are you? Happy V-Day. Happy V-Day. I've got some bread pudding. <gasps> oh, fantastic. Oh. Hello. 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 Nice to see you. You look very Hello. dressed up. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh! 
This is lovely food. Oh, I'm ready for these. Oh, we really must enjoy this. The Chamber of Commerce are back to find out what the customers made of their wartime experience. Is there anything about this uh, wartime Britain High Street that you would like your kids to inherit? One thing that, that came out of the war, which was, we're all in this together, let's not be greedy, let's all help each other. You managed a week, would you like to manage two months? Or a year? It we wouldn't be it. much fun, but we could do it. We got used to putting less butter on things, but we got used to it. As I stood there in the queue, I, I realised that we customers had never met each other before, and, and I was talking to people who lived in Shepton that I'd never met, well, n never spoken to before, and it was all sort of bringing us together. People went without, yet are still talking about what a wonderful community yeah. spirit it was. Now, OK, to build a community spirit at the same time as you're hungry, I mean, how powerful was the feeling here? I think that's right. I mean, and the people were talking about queuing, and imagine queuing, you know, hour, you might queue for several hours and still not got what you wanted after that. But people talked about getting to know people um, in the queues. They talked about wanting to come back into Shepton Mallet. They found it a more sociable place, and they felt they've got to know each other in a way that they hadn't before. Well, the grocers have caused controversy this week. I mean, they can't help it. They're natural salespeople. They want to make a profit, and, and I'll take my hat off to them there, but they really didn't understand, A, the era they were in, how tough it was, and B, what people would have thought of them. If there was plenty of black market trading going on, would you feel left out that you had? Good heavens, no. I'd be appalled. No, I'd have shocked anybody if I'd known about it. You would? No, without hesitation, mm. even if I knew them. Because otherwise, if you go on like that, the whole system would just fall apart. She born actually said that she bought some stuff on the black market. I, I was totally affronted. I thought, why wasn't I offered it? Because I had money, I could have bought that stuff. The high street really did come together as a community, and they were all going without. To then suddenly find out that they had sacrificed while others were cheating has caused a fair bit of anger. He was profiteering. He was selling goods um, that were off the rations to turn a quick buck, and he did it in wartime, and that's not on. The bakers have had a fantastic week. Yeah, this has really been their era. I think they've been exemplary. I think they are just really terrific people who actually share and care, and that's exactly what you would have needed in this era. I don't think they've had to try that hard. I think that's them. Enjoy. Wow, oh, thank you, sir. Not a problem. Good man. You just can't fault these people. They've really taken, you know, they've taken us to their hearts, and, and I, I actually feel the same about them. We're, we are just a complete community now, and it's, it, it just means so much. I don't know what we're going to do when these shopkeepers go back. It's brought this place, this town, alive. Jill's a lovely girl. What do you make of the dressmaker? She's made the most fantastic contribution, I think, to the war effort. She's trying to show the people of Shepton Mallet that they don't have to buy anything, that they've got a lot of stuff in their wardrobes that they can make, make over and, and make nice. Simon, you know, has really enjoyed this era because he's found himself very useful in the community and that's what he wanted to be right from the start. He's shown people that there is another way. You don't just have to buy cheap things and obsolescent. You can actually buy something and have it repaired and keep it going and make do and mend. They've shown people that, you know, things don't have to be disposable. There is an afterlife for them. But Simon's days on the high street are drawing to an end. After the war, as Britain increasingly embraced mass-produced, disposable goods, demand for blacksmiths disappeared. I'll miss this forge absolutely immensely. This, this to me, this, this is me. This is what I do. This is my environment, and it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I will miss it really, really with a, uh, a sad and heavy heart. It's time for Simon to say goodbye to the high street, and he's made them a farewell gift. So I've taken all sorts of bits and pieces to produce a frame from the scrap that the townspeople of Shepton Mallet gave me this week. We were the world's first recyclers and we're bloody good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my present to the town. Can we go? Can we go? Yeah.
It's sad to see my craft disappear from the high street, but at the same time, I'm hoping that by doing this project, I'm going to give it a new lease of life. Others aren't so sad to see the back of the wall. I didn't like World War II mainly because we had nothing to sell. That's what I'm all about. That's my life. That's what I do. I'm a showman. I sell food. I sell products. And I absolutely sweet Fanny Adams to sell. For everybody that has entered into the spirit of it, it's made, it's made the community and the shopkeepers just so much closer. I mean, we are a real team now, all of us. What an absolutely amazing week. Devlin's, your commitment to this high street has been unbelievable. That, I think, is probably the spirit that actually did get Britain through really tough times. Well done. Grocers. Oh, the controversy. Bad boys and girls. Not the spirit that got us through the blitz at all. We got caught, we've been done, and that's life. But we'll carry on, the business will keep going, and uh, watch this space. Next time, it's the swinging 60s. And in this time of excess, there's no stopping Carl's empire. So I reckon we're going to clean up quite happily. But he'll also learn that dominating the high street has consequences. Yeah, I'm a bit upset. <laughs> it's very rare that I'm lost for words. <laughs>